Again, good evening and welcome to all that are able to be here. We're so glad to see everyone for our evening worship services. I hope that the study that we have to engage in together tonight will be beneficial and helpful for every one of us. Uh, we're starting a new series as the teachers tonight, one that I personally am looking forward to very much. Uh, what we are going to do over the next 12 or 13 weeks or so is each one of the teachers has picked out a couple of Old Testament characters or Old Testament events, and uh, we are going to teach through various character studies or maybe event studies based upon what the various teachers teach from the Old Testament. Uh, growing up, some of my favorite sermons that I remember hearing from men like Jerry Dickinson and others uh, that taught frequently on the Old Testament was these stories from the Old Testament. I loved it when mom or dad would read these various stories to me at home. I loved to hear sermons on them, and even today, I love to hear men preach and to teach about these wonderful characters, the wonderful men and women and heroes of the faith. And I love to hear the various passages and books of the Old Testament taught on. A lot of times we overlook much of what's in the Old Testament because it is the Old Testament. And, and it is true, we live under the new and we live uh, under the new covenant. But Paul told the Romans that the things that were written before were written for our learning and for our admonition. And so that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. And some of the greatest stories and some of the greatest examples, some of the greatest sources of hope and faith and admonishment come from the wonderful stories of the Old Testament. And so I look forward to this series of lessons, Lord willing, each Sunday night. Uh, I and the other teachers will be teaching through some of these lessons. And so we invite you, always try and be back on Sunday evenings. The other thing that I really like about these, not that other lessons are not good for younger kids, but um, I've noticed that most times children like to be able to listen to these stories at well. And these are really some of the places that children begin learning the Bible. Like I said, it's really my earliest memories are some of the stories of Old Testament figures. And so I encourage you, bring the children and have them pay attention to the stories that we'll be reading about from God's Word in the Old Testament. We're going to start with a story from the life of Abraham. And by the way, we're not going to um, really go through a specific agenda. Like I said, every, every teacher has just picked out a couple, and so we might actually jump back and forth throughout the Old Testament, uh, but we're just going to spend a couple of months talking about some of the Old Testament individuals. But to kick off uh, our series on Old Testament characters, I decided to give a lesson or do a study on a specific event from the life of Abraham. One of the difficulties whenever we tackle these, and I've heard some of the other teachers make the same comment, if you're trying to do a character study, many times the characters of the Old Testament, it's difficult, if not impossible, to really do justice to them and their lives in one sermon. For example, it would be very difficult to give a very good overview of the life of Moses and really get into any detail at all in one sermon. And the same is true for Abraham. And so what I've done tonight is we're just going to look at one story out of Abraham's life. There's a lot that we could look at in Abraham's life, but we're going to look at one of the events that really was the climax of Abraham's life. It is the final major story that we have about Abraham, and it's found there in Genesis chapter 22. I don't think this will be a very new story for anybody, but it is a wonderful story. And quite honestly, the story in Genesis 22 is one of my favorite stories in all of the Bible because it is a beautiful Old Testament story, but as many of the Old Testament stories are, it is a type and a foreshadowing of something far, far greater than just the events that took place on that day. And so if you'd like to turn over to Genesis chapter 22, we won't read all 18 verses at once, but as we go through our sermon tonight, we will be reading uh, through these 18 verses and making comments on the passage that is there. But as a very brief way of introduction, we will just discuss or overview really Abraham's life leading up to this because we do need to realize that we're jumping in at the end of Abraham's life uh, or towards the end of Abraham's life when we get to Genesis chapter 22. And so what had precipitated this? What had come before? Well, you probably remember that uh, Abraham was a stranger. He was uh, uh, an individual that lived in the east. He lived in an area called Ur of the Chaldeans, and he had been called out of that land by God. That's when we're really introduced to Abraham back in Genesis chapter 12. And God called Abraham to come out from his people, and Abraham obeyed the voice of God. He was already, if I recall correctly, 75 years old when he first heard that call of God. 
and when he began to follow God and to obey Him. But his life was a series of trials. And one of the things that we need to learn and know about Abraham and Moses and David and all the other incredible towering figures of faith in the Old Testament is they were all learning. And we look at men like Abraham, who is the father of the faithful, and we think that he was this, uh, this man who had achieved this level of righteousness from the very beginning. And he was a very impressive man, even from the very first time that he followed God. But we have to remember that Abraham, like every other man and every other woman that's ever lived and been righteous and faithful, had to grow in his knowledge of God. He had to grow in his relationship with God. And he was not a perfect man. If you go back and you read Genesis 12 through Genesis 22, you'll see some failures on the part of Abraham. You'll see some mistakes that this man made, some sins that this man committed. He wasn't a perfect man, but he was a growing man. And he was a man that when he made mistakes, he turned back to God. He was a man that trusted in God. Sometimes he had to be reminded of that, and he had to return to his faith. But he was a man that placed great trust in God. He was a very faithful man. So he travels to the land of Canaan. We read of him traveling down to Egypt during a severe famine. We read about him having to separate from his nephew Lot. and We remember that story. He had brought his nephew Lot along with him, and the land couldn't hold all of their, their sheep and all their flocks. So he gives his nephew Lot the choice of which way he wants to go. And of course, Lot chose to go towards Sodom. But God made a promise there. Even though Lot had taken the nicer-looking land, God had promised Abraham there in Genesis 13. He says, you look around all this land, and you know that this land will be given to your descendants. Well, a little bit later, Lot was captured along with many of the inhabitants of Sodom. And so Abraham found out and he had to go and even facing superior numbers, he rescued Lot and the other inhabitants. And that's where we meet the uh, kind of mysterious character of Melchizedek who blesses Abraham in Genesis 14. Genesis 15 is a very important chapter where God makes his covenant with Abram, Abraham, changes his name to Abraham from Abram. And then Genesis 16, of course, this is one of those mistakes that Abraham and Sarah made, trying to push along God's plan because God had promised to make him a great nation and give him a son. But Sarah was past the age of childbearing. And so they thought perhaps like some of the other cultures around them, maybe his offspring would have to come through a, a servant wife. And so Sarah gives Hagar to Abraham. And Ishmael is the child that is born from that. But God tells them Ishmael is not to be the son of promise, but there will be a child from uh, Sarah. He receives the covenant of circumcision in chapter 17. Again, a very important chapter about the covenant between God and Abraham. God promises in that, ver in that chapter, in chapter 18, the birth of Isaac. He comes uh, to Abraham and he tells him that in a year that he will have a son. Sarah can't hardly believe it, but yet it comes to pass. And so God's promises, and by the way, this is nearly 25 years after Abraham had first followed God and first received uh, the promise that he would become a great nation. 25 years later, God is making good on the promise. And he finally has the son that has been promised to him. There's an encounter with the king of Gerar in chapter 20. In chapter 21, we have the birth of Isaac. And imagine how wonderful that must have been for Abraham at 100 years of age. Past his age of childbearing, it would seem, uh, even though he had more children after this, and definitely past Sarah's age of childbearing, God miraculously grants them this child of promise, as he is referred to. And we can only imagine the great love that uh, Abraham and that Sarah had for their son as they received this one and only child that was truly and solely theirs. And as that child grew, surely Abraham loved his son and Sarah as well. But then we come to chapter 22, which is the basis for our sermon tonight, and we find that God has another test for Abraham. There is one more test that Abraham must face, and we find that. And in verse chapter 22, verses 1 and 2, it says, After these things God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, as I just mentioned in the introduction, spiritual maturity does not happen all at once, but it happens over time. 
The other thing is, spiritual maturity is never something that we have in completion. But even when we've reached a great level of spiritual maturity, we may still face testing, and we may still face trials. And even though Abraham had grown a great deal in the decade since he had first begun to follow God, there is still another test for this great man to face. As he had begun many years earlier to follow the Lord, and he had faced many temptations, he had faced many trials and tests, and he had grown to a point where it could be said of him, as is recorded in Genesis 15 and 6, he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. Again, a very important verse from that chapter, one that is echoed multiple times in the New Testament about the greatness of Abraham. He believed the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham grew in his faith and his trust of the Lord to the point that when the Lord spoke, Abraham believed it. And when the Lord commanded something, Abraham obeyed it. He had a marvelous faith. And by the way, we'll make that point, I think, by the time we get to the end. Abraham is known for his faith, but his faith is illustrated immensely in his obedience. And thus, God tests him. You know, even Isaac, his beloved son, cannot come between God and Abraham. And that is going to be one of the keys of this test. Before this covenant promise can be fully promised, before it can be fully established, Abraham must show that there is nothing between him and God, that there is nothing that comes before God in Abraham's life, that he is truly willing to trust God and follow God in all circumstances. And that sets up the scene for this text, where God comes to him and says, Give me your son, your only son Isaac, as a burnt offering. Now this must have been a very difficult command. This must have been a very challenging command. We can only imagine. You know, to have this of any child would be strange. The other thing is God had never even hinted that this is something that he had wanted before. Now, some of the other pagan nations may have partook in child sacrifice, but as we find in the later in the law of God, that was something abhorred by God. So this is not something that comes upon Abraham as an idea based upon the foreign nations, but it's a command of God to give his son as a sacrifice to the Lord. As one man said, Abraham's trust was to be weighed in the balance against common sense, human affection, and lifelong ambition, in fact, against everything earthly. The command had to go against everything in Abraham's mind and his logic and in his reasoning. God had promised Abraham a son. God had promised that through that son Isaac that Abraham would become a great nation. And now it seems in a moment, in an instant, God is taking away everything he has promised. How could this be? How could God take away the child that he had promised? How could God go back on his promise? For even today, many people balk at the story. Many people get angry at the story and question how could God test Abraham in this manner? Why would God test Abraham in his manner? Well, the reason that takes place is because sometimes our mind acts according to human reasoning and human logic, and that simply is out of line. It would have been very easy for Abraham to reason along these ways. It would have been easy for him to uh, logically dictate that this command was counterproductive to the earlier promises of God. He could have reasoned in his mind, this is a cruel request. This is maybe even an immoral request. And yet, Abraham did not rely upon his own reasoning. Abraham relied upon his faith. As one commentator said, Abraham brought his reason into captivity to the obedience of faith. That's a remarkable comment on this passage. And it's something that we would do well to exercise and put into place in our lives. Mankind is so good at reasoning away God's commands. At logically explaining away the requirements of God's Word. We can explain away moral issues. We can explain away doctrinal matters. We can explain away purposes in worship, all by our great reasoning, because the commands of God just don't seem to be up to date. They just don't seem to be as pleasant as we would like them to be. And when that is the case, we are the furthest thing from Abraham that there can be. What our duty is, what our responsibility is, is to bring our reason into captivity to the obedience of faith. To hear the Lord's Word, believe the Lord's Word, trust the Lord's Word, and thus 
obey the Lord's word so that our ultimate reasoning is not our reasoning, but God's reasoning. That doesn't mean that we're illogical people or unreasonable people, but it means that we trust in God's word first and foremost and above everything else. Now, the other thing about this text is it tells us that uh, God told Abraham to go to the land of Moriah. And there the Lord would tell him the mountain on which to offer Isaac. Now this area, uh, Moriah, is in the vicinity of Jerusalem. Abraham is living at a pretty good distance away from what would later become Jerusalem. And this place obviously becomes an important and significant role. In fact, even in other Old Testament events. In 2 Chronicles 3 verses 1 and 2, we learn that it is actually in this place in Moriah, upon a mountain there, that David goes and meets the angel of the Lord. Remember, David had uh, done a census of the nation, and that was a sinful thing. And so God punished him, and there was a plague, and there were uh, hundreds and thousands of people dying by this plague. And David implored the Lord, uh, and, and the Lord stopped his angel at this specific place, and David went to the house uh, uh, of Arunia, I believe it was called. And there he made a sacrifice to God. That was this very place. Because it was that place, it is also where Solomon would build the temple. Isn't that amazing? That where God instructed Abraham to go offer this sacrifice was in the immediate vicinity of where later the very temple to God would be. Which means it was in the very vicinity, not very far away at all, from where one day the cross of Christ would be put. And where God's only beloved son would be sacrificed. But Abraham begins to head off to Moriah. In Genesis 22, verses 3 through 5, it says, So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I, I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Now, it's easy to read over that first phrase, but it's remarkable that despite the difficulty and the unpleasantness of the command, Abraham wasted absolutely no time in obeying the Lord. It says that he rose early in the morning. Now, whether or not he was a typical early riser, when it came to obeying the Lord, he rose early. You find that phrase earlier in his life. But of all the times that Abraham must have been tempted to not rise so early, of all the times that he should have been tempted to make the, make the preparations take a little bit longer, last a little bit longer, wouldn't it be this time? Can't you imagine the, the great desire to spend a few more hours at home with Isaac and Sarah together? Don't you think it would have been tempting to take a little longer, gathering the donkeys and the water needed for the journey and everything else? And yet the picture that we get is that the Lord had given Abraham a command and Abraham proceeds to obey, not with lackadaisical attitude, not with grudging compulsion, but with diligent obedience. Obedience to the Lord's word is never something to be put off or to be delayed even for a moment. Even when the Lord's commands are difficult, even when they maybe go against our nature, our responsibility is to faithfully and promptly obey. We would do well to heed Abraham's example. And I encourage all of us to look at our own lives this very day. And if there are ways in which we realize our lives are not in accordance with the commands of God, don't wait to make those things right. Don't wait to obey the gospel. Don't wait to get some sin out of your life. Don't wait to make things right that need to be made right. If you realize that the Lord's commands in your life have not been heeded, it's time to diligently obey them and, and stop with putting them off. But the journey to Moriah apparently took roughly three days. It says that it was on the third day that he lifted his eyes and he sold the place off in some distance. Now, it was the third day of the uh, that he had been traveling. And in this, we get um, a picture of the foreshadowing of this event. Apparently, Abraham had not told Isaac. He had not told the other men about what was taking place. They were following Abraham to worship, but he had not told them 
that the actual sacrifice was Isaac. Because Isaac doesn't know, as we'll see here in just a moment. So for three days, Abraham alone has been bearing the burden that his son is dead. This entire trip, Isaac is as good as dead to Abraham because he knows what the command is and he knows what awaits him upon their arrival. And it is upon this third day that they arrive and on this third day, that's skipping ahead in the story a little bit, we know he will receive his son back again. On the third day, Isaac is in a sense resurrected because it is on the third day that he is given back to him by the Lord. So this is just one of the many ways in which this beautiful story foreshadows the crucifixion, which after his death, on the third day, of course, he came back from the grave. But at this point, Abraham instructs his servants to stay behind. He informs them that he and Isaac are going to go and worship. But he insinuates that they both will also return. Now, Some people have thought maybe he was just lying here, but I don't think there's any reason to believe that Abraham is lying. On the contrary, I think this is an indication of this man's incredible faith. In God. God had promised that Abraham's seed would come through Isaac. God had promised this son. God had promised that through Isaac, Abraham would become a great nation. This command to sacrifice Isaac would apparently negate the promise, but Abraham did not view it that way. Remember, Abraham believed God, and Abraham still believed God. Thus, he believed that even through this offering, some way, somehow, God would fulfill His promise. The Hebrew writer expounds it for us. In Hebrews 11, verse 17 through 19, says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise was in, fact, was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Here's a question for you. Where did Abraham get the faith that Isaac could be brought back from the dead? Where else before Abraham's time do we know of someone being brought back from the dead? As far as I can tell, there's no record of anyone being brought back from the dead. He's never seen this. He's never heard this that we know of. But his faith and his trust in God has become so complete. God has proven himself faithful. And he has come to the point where he believes God so much that when God says it is through Isaac that your seed will be propagated, that he believes that to be true absolutely. Even if God says you must offer Isaac, perhaps the only thing he could reason in his mind is God's going to raise him from the dead. That's the only thing maybe that he can come up with. But he believes it. He has faith in God to fulfill his promise. And if that's not the way God's going to fulfill his promise, which it's not, then God will fulfill it in some other way. But he obeys God, despite perhaps not being able to fully figure out how God's promises will come into being. We don't have to know everything. We don't have to understand the workings of everything. We don't have to understand the minute details of how God does everything. But we need to believe God. And we need to trust His promises. Some people say, I don't get how God could forgive me. Maybe we can't figure out how God could forgive someone like us. But he said he will. He said that the, son, that the blood of his son is good enough to cover you. No matter what you've done. No matter what you've said. No matter what you've thought. No matter how black your life has been. Trust God. Trust his promises. Think I, I can't imagine that heaven is a place that I can go. Well God said it is. God said that can be your home. Christ has promised that if you'll believe and if you'll obey Him. Trust the promises of God and live accordingly. Well, as we move on to this, we move to one of the most beautiful sections of Scripture. A conversation that takes place between Abraham and his son. In verses 6 through 8, after they depart from the company of the servants, it says, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together, and Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, or, and said to his father, Abraham, my father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. Now, Isaac must have been at least a teenager, if not already an adult, 
to be able to be strong enough to carry this load of wood that it would have required to build an altar and a sacrifice. A small child cannot carry a load of wood like this. That means that Isaac is fairly grown. That means Isaac has quite a bit of strength compared to his father, who if he is a teenager or in his early 20s is now 115 or 120 or older, Isaac could overpower Abraham quite easily probably, which shows us the very impressive character of Isaac, by the way, when it becomes clear what they're doing. But a little bit more on that perhaps in a moment. But as they're traveling, as they're going up the mountain, uh, Isaac realizes something. Isaac realizes they have the wood. Isaac realizes they have the knife, they have the fire, but they don't have the sacrifice. And in this picture is something beautiful because we see Abraham carrying the knife and the fire. He is the father that must carry out the execution just as God the Father would one day have to carry out and see to it that his son was offered as a sacrifice. Isaac is walking carrying the wood that is to be the means of his death. Just as many years later in a very similar vicinity, very close to where they are now, Jesus would walk through the streets bearing the cross. That would be the instrument of his death. And Isaac, as he notices that the sacrifice is missing, he cries out, My father. And now for the second time in this narrative, we're told that Abraham utters the words, Here I am. The first time was in response to God, which led to this whole scene. I kind of wonder if he ever regretted saying, Here I am the first time when God first called. But here with a burdened heart, he responds to his son. The son has a question and he is there to answer. And in this brief little exchange, we see a beautiful picture of a godly father. And all of us that are fathers, or grandfathers, would do well to emulate Abraham's example. We see, first of all, that Abraham put God first, even above his children. Most parents balk at this story. Because we cannot imagine losing a child in service to God. And it's a hard thing to imagine. And I don't know that anyone has ever faced the difficulty as acutely as Abraham. But when it came to between, between choosing his beloved son and serving God, Abraham served God. And that was not a slight against Isaac. And Isaac wasn't embittered by that. It was an incredible example and a lesson for Isaac. And dads, our children need to see in our lives that they are not number one. God is. And that's a challenge from time to time. But they need to see that in our life and in our family and in everything we do, even when it concerns them, God is who we serve. If they see that anything comes before God, including themselves, how do you think they're going to grow up to learn that God should be first in their life? That was the first lesson that Abraham taught. But secondly, Abraham was simply there for his son. I don't want to make a, a mountain out of a molehill here. But you compare Abraham's response with a lack of fatherhood in our nation. The fact that this, this, this young man, when he cried out for his father, he could actually say, here I am. How many children in our country tonight wish they had a dad in their home, wish that they had a dad in their lives, but dad is nowhere to be found because he can't be bothered with the responsibility of children. Abraham had always been there. And even in these darkest and most difficult of times, Abraham was there. And that's what a father is. And we as fathers should always be there for our sons and for our daughters and for our families. But Abraham had also taught his son how to serve God. Notice that Isaac begins to look at the scene and he notices something is amiss. Why does he know something is amiss? Because this isn't the first time Isaac has gone with his dad to make a sacrifice. Because through his life, Abraham has taught his son how to serve and how to worship God. Many fathers teach their children how to throw a ball, how to tie a fishing hook, 
how to spell, how to read, how to make and save money, and all these other things that are fine and they're good and, and they can be perfectly acceptable. But none of those things prepare them for eternity. And none of those things teach them how to serve their God. If the only thing you ever teach your child is how to serve God, you will have been a successful father. And we fathers need to be putting this as a prime uh, priority in our lives to teach our children how to serve God. But Abraham taught his son to trust in God. He taught him how to serve God, and he taught him to trust in God. And when the scene begins to, be get, to get peculiar, because there's no sacrifice, and I can't help but wonder if something started to dawn on Isaac, that something's amiss. But the reassuring words of his father are always there in his ears. The Lord will provide. Teach your children, fathers, to trust in the Lord. Teach them of his love. Teach them of his power. Teach, him that he is, teach them that He is there. Teach them that He cares. Teach them of what He has done and what He has promised. Instill in your children a love for God and a trust in Him always. Abraham taught Isaac to trust in the Lord with those beautiful words, God will provide for Himself the Lamb for a burnt offering, my son. This stands as one of the greatest messages in all the Bible. It shows the beauty of true faith. Because despite the hardest circumstances, Abraham could be strong because his trust was in God. When our trust is truly in God, we can face trial, we can face adversity, we can face pain, we can face loss, we can face temptation, we can face any and every struggle that we might encounter because faith is not in man, it is not in ourselves, but our faith is in God. Even in this most trying of times, Paul trusted in God and thus found great strength. It reminds me of Paul's attitude in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8 and 9, speaking about his thorn in the flesh. When he said, Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. You remember that always. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're struggling with, God's grace, Christ's grace is sufficient if we will believe in Him and follow Him. But further, Abraham's response is ultimately the great promise of God. The great message of the gospel. The great message of the entire biblical narrative is focused on this promise right here. On this hope that God will provide a lamb. For Isaac and Abraham that day, it literally happened. As we'll see in just a moment, a ram was caught by its horns in the thickets, and that ram became a substitute for Isaac. God literally provided that specific day. But this was typical of a far greater provision. This was the promise of man's redemption. This is how man is going to be blessed through the seed of Abraham, through the coming of Christ, who is God's Son, whom God will provide as the sacrificial lamb to take our place. Yes, God was going to provide the lamb and it was going to be his beloved son. Well, as we continue on, we come to the point where they've arrived and Abraham prepares the sacrifice. This is, you can, you can get the sense of a storyteller in, in chapter 22 because now that we've, we've covered some details very quickly in just the text, you know, we, we pass over three days without any mention of details. And then we kind of go quickly through them departing from the servants. But as it gets to this point, every detail is laid out. It says, when they came to the place which God had told them, Abraham built the altar and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. Every detail is given emphasis here. As the climax is building, and surely it must have been rending Abraham's heart every single step of the way. But then, just as he takes the knife, and as he's ready to take the life of his own son, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son your only son from me. As Abraham was ready to slay his son, that voice called out, 
emphatically, Abraham, Abraham, calling for his attention for the third time in this event, in this narrative, Abraham responds with a, here I am. If there were any doubts about his re returning the call of God originally, they are all gone. And what a true blessing it is to hear the word of the Lord and respond to it. Yes, sometimes the commands of God are challenging. It was the first time that Abraham responded, here I am in this narrative. But when we obey, when we continue to listen, when we continue to hear his voice, blessings are sure to follow. And how grateful Abraham must have been to hear the voice of the Lord on this occasion. How thankful he must have been to have responded to the voice of the Lord. We may not always understand God's commands, but faith is about trust and obedience obeying His commands and trusting His promises. And I promise you this, if you will respond to the call and the voice of the Lord and to His commands, in the end, in eternity, you will not regret it. For you will be truly blessed. But the Lord commands him to spare Isaac, for the true test has been passed. See, God never intended for Isaac to die in this way. The purpose of the test was to ensure that Abraham put God first and further that he trusted God completely, and Abraham had abundantly proven both. While he never slew his son in his mind, he had already sacrificed Isaac, for he had determined to obey the Lord. Verses 13 and 14 say, Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Just as, God, as Abraham had said, God had provided that sacrifice. It's important to notice that the sacrifice was not abandoned. They had come here to worship, and they were going to worship. They didn't leave without sacrificing to God. There had to be something substitute, Isaac. There still needed to be a sacrifice made. And so this ram, caught by its horns in a thicket nearby, becomes a substitutionary sacrifice. Its life's blood is slain and poured out, and its life is given in place of Isaac. And once more, we have the beautiful imagery of the cross where Jesus became that substitute. That time when God truly and fully and finally provided the substitute for us. You see, our sin brings about death. The wages of sin is death. And we deserve to die. But God provided a substitute. And it was His Son. See, Jesus would climb a very similar hill bearing the instrument of His death. But no hand that day halted the Roman soldiers. No voice cried out from heaven telling the procession to stop. No other substitute was found for God's Son because He was the substitute. And God did what He did not ultimately require of Abraham. See, people question how God could even ask this of Abraham. And that's quite a mockery of God when you consider that God did this for Abraham, for Isaac, for you, for me. He let his son go. And he let his son become the substitute so that our sins could be washed away. And we should never forget that lesson. In Genesis 22, verse 15 through 18, as we wrap up these final verses, it says, And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time and from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Abraham had proven faithful. And thus God confirmed the promise and the covenant that had been made. This promise is in many ways the foundational promise of God's redemptive purposes. The Jews saw this as a promise of the establishment of national Israel, but God always, from the time He made this promise, had something greater than national Israel in mind. He was speaking about spiritual Israel. As national Israel would be the means by which God would reveal His plan, He would reveal His word, He would send His Son through national Israel, 
But the promise of blessing through Abraham was always for all nations. It was through his seed that all nations would be blessed. Abraham would not simply be the father of the Israelites, but as Paul says in the book of Romans, he would become the father of all who believe. And the immutability of this promise of God's plan and his blessing is shown in the fact that for one of the only times in Scripture, God swears by himself. That's emphatic. There is nothing higher on which an oath can be made. In fact, in all of the patriarchal age, in all of the law of Moses, never again does God swear by himself. It only occurs a couple of times amongst some of the prophets. And the Hebrew writer remarks in this, I'm not going to read all of this uh, for time's sake, but it opens and says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. He goes on to tell, tell about the high priest that is Jesus, who has secured our salvation. That is the culmination of this promise of the substitutionary lamb, of the way that all the nations of the earth, which means you and means me, would be blessed by giving of His Son. You know, we are very blessed to live on this side of the cross. We're blessed to live in a time where we see the fulfillment of so many of God's promises and to be a part of that great fulfillment. And we should be thankful for the faithful men and women that have gone before us. Thankful for men like Abraham who endure trials and provide us with wonderful examples of faith and obedience. I want you to remember that final phrase. Because you have obeyed my voice. Paul or Abraham is pointed to as an example of faith. And rightfully so. But people use what Paul says in the book of Romans. That he believed in God and it was counted to him as righteousness. To try and teach false doctrines. To try and teach ideas of faith alone. But while Abraham is an incredible example of faith. While he is the father of those who believe. His faith always produced something, constantly produced something. Obedience. And God's final promise, His establishment of the promise, was because Abraham didn't just believe, but because Abraham had obeyed His voice. And so as we consider this wonderful story, and as we bring this lesson to an end, the question is, have we obeyed the voice of God? Have you accepted the invitation of God? Have you responded to His call by trusting in His plan, by trusting in His promises, and obeying His word? As Abraham foretold and God had promised, God has provided a means by which you can be saved through the precious blood of His beloved Son, and through His death on the cross, through His burial, and through His resurrection. You can be forgiven. Do you believe that? If you believe that, have you acted upon it? Have you obeyed it? Have you repented of your sins? Have you confessed the name of Christ? Have you been baptized for the remission of your sins? If not, why not? Why not accept that great invitation? Why spurn the substitutionary sacrifice that Christ has become and is for you by refusing to obey? If you've not taken those steps, we would encourage you, we'd implore you to think about that and make that choice to do so tonight. Or if you have, but you've gone back into the path of sin, why? Change that. Come back to God. Repent of those sins. Confess them before Him and ask for His forgiveness. Or if you want us to pray with you and for you for some sin that you've committed, we'd be happy to do that. Whatever it might be, whether it be obedience to the gospel or whether it be uh, confession and prayers to make you right with God once again, Obey the voice of the Lord and do so without delay. Do so while we stand and while we sing.